News on the march. In 1971, film critic Pauline Kael wrote Raising Cain, a book-length essay arguing that credit for Citizen Kane had been unfairly attributed to the film's director Orson Welles, and that screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz was the real author behind the seminal film. Though Kael's essay was later discredited, the basic premise that Welles' collaborators deserve more credit for the film's achievement is valid. Citizen Kane is best understood not as the artistic vision of one man, but as the end result of a long process of collaboration characteristic of the Hollywood studio system. A brief overview of the film's production history, specifically the writing, art direction, and cinematography, reveal the intense collaboration that made the film's innovation and artistry possible. This is not to dismiss Wells, who was indeed central to each of these elements, but to demonstrate how important collaboration and a shared creativity were to Citizen Kane's success, and to classic Hollywood filmmaking as a whole. It should be noted that the central source of information for this vodcast is Robert L. Carringer's book The Making of Citizen Kane. Orson Welles was first brought to Hollywood by RKO studio head George Schaefer, who offered Welles the opportunity to produce, direct, write, and star in two films, provided the studio approved the story. Wells first set out to adapt Joseph Conrad's classic novel Heart of Darkness and The Smiler with the Knife, based on a mystery novel, incidentally written by Daniel Day-Lewis's father, but both projects fell apart, largely due to the amateur Wells attempting to do everything himself. For his next project, Wells would be sure to assemble a knowledgeable and experienced staff who could bring the work to fruition. That next project would become Citizen Kane. Wells' first step with Citizen Kane was to seek out an experienced screenwriter for assistance, ultimately partnering with Herman J. Mankiewicz. There is some debate whether it was Wells or Mankiewicz who first hit upon the idea of a film depicting the life of a press baron inspired by William Randolph Hearst, but whatever the case, the meetings between the two did provide a basic premise for a film. From March through May of 1940, Mankiewicz, based on his conversations with Wells, wrote the first two drafts of a screenplay, with producer John Houseman working as editor and secretary Rita Alexander taking dictation. These early drafts were messy and unfocused, but they did provide a firm story structure. The film would be the biography of a newspaper tycoon, told in flashback after his death. This narrative framework is widely noted as one of Kane's boldest innovations, but it's worth noting that a similar story structure had been used in the 1933 film The Power and the Glory. However, where that film struggled with the ambitious framework, Mankiewicz streamlined the story by centering Citizen Kane on the mystery of Rosebud, the protagonist's dying word. Other major elements of Citizen Kane born in the Mankiewicz drafts include the desolate halls of Xanadu, Susan's failed opera career, Kane's first marriage, and the opera review. Much of what Mankiewicz wrote was changed as the script continued to evolve. A subplot revolving around a presidential assassination is one of the most notable omissions in the final script, but subtler details needed changes too. Most importantly, Kane himself was more an amalgamation of different aspects of William Randolph Hearst than a fully developed character in his own right. Additionally, while many of the ingredients of the film were already in place, Mankiewicz's second draft was still far too long and unwieldy to be filmed. Mankiewicz left for another assignment, and Wells took over the revisions. Over the course of several drafts, Wells condensed the material for a far leaner screenplay. Crucial to this was the use of montage to tell complex parts of the story, like the montage depicting the Inquirer's growth in circulation and rising influence in American culture, or the breakfast table montage, which condensed the disintegration of Kane and Emily's marriage to a single sequence. Kane himself would become a more fleshed out character in these drafts. Storylines like Leland's opera review were changed to play continuously rather than separated by narrators, and Wells also added the famous mirror shot. Other factors beyond Wells and Mankiewicz led to script changes. The Hayes office, responsible for the reviewing and censoring of American motion pictures according to Hollywood standards, objected to a scene set in a brothel, while the skyrocketing budget caused RKO to axe a segment of the young Kane vacationing in Rome. Though Wells and Mankiewicz brought different elements to the film, and at different points, it is clear that Citizen Kane would not exist as it is were it not for the collaboration between the two. An element crucial to Citizen Kane is its elaborate and large-scale sets. To that end, RKO appointed one of its top-tier art directors, Perry Ferguson, to the project. Ferguson had cut his teeth on B-pictures, but eventually made a name for himself working on some of RKO's biggest movies. This experience made Ferguson an expert at working on expensive, high-risk projects, making him an ideal match for Kane. Wells and Ferguson would discuss scenes at length, with Ferguson taking notes and using these conversations to instruct the art department in their sketches. These sketches would then be brought to Wells for approval, with the process continuing until satisfaction was reached. 
This collaboration was deepened with the arrival of cinematographer Greg Toland. The three men formed a creative nucleus for Kane, meeting every morning to discuss virtually every visual aspect of the film. Wells and Toland's photographic ambitions necessitated certain choices for Ferguson in the art department. For example, the desire for many low-angle shots required building sets with ceilings. Additionally, the recurring use of deep focus, wherein objects in the background and the foreground could be in focus at once, meant Ferguson had to design deep sets that allowed for this design. Sometimes this was accomplished through illusion, as with the Xanadu set, where black velvet rolls were used in the background to imply an extreme depth. The efforts of the art department, under Ferguson's direction, were not merely technical aspects of completing the film, but creative endeavors crucial to the storytelling. Take the stage during Kane's political rally. The large banner, paired with the low angle shot, emphasized that Kane is at the height of his hubris. Better still, Kane's home of Xanadu, which mirrors its owner's personality. Though grand and impressive from the outside, the inside is revealed to be hollow and empty. The design may not make total architectural sense, but an art department's job is to help tell the story, not create realistic architecture. One of Wells' most crucial collaborators was director of photography Greg Toland. Not only did Toland teach the newcomer Wells many of the basics of cinematography, but he also imparted to the young director the importance of cinematography in telling a film's story. Together, the two mapped out a visual plan that emphasized wide angles, high contrast lighting, long takes, camera movement, deep focus, and multiplane compositions. Toland had employed similar techniques before, notably in his collaborations with John Ford just a few years earlier, but with Kane, Toland was able to push these techniques to further extremes. Furthermore, such cinematography choices in Citizen Kane were not just a matter of style, but crucial storytelling tools. High contrast lighting emphasizes the moral contradictions of Kane himself, an idealistic dreamer who was overtaken by greed and hubris. Much of Kane's rise in the film is characterized by bright lights, his downfall by dark shadows, Shadows. Deep focus and multiplane compositions, meanwhile, are used extensively to denote power dynamics. Take this scene where Kane's adoption by Mr. Thatcher is being discussed. Mary Kane sits in the foreground, conveying her power within the scene. Sitting next to her is Mr. Thatcher, suggesting the two are in agreement. Mary's husband stands on the opposite side of the frame and in the middle ground, suggesting that he has less power than his wife in deciding their child's future, and that they have different views on the subject, at least until he hears about how much money is involved. Between them is the young Kane, both physically and as the object of their disagreement, and his placement in the back of the frame communicates his lack of power in the choice being made about his fate. By using multiplane compositions, and a set that enables deep focus photography, the film is able to communicate multiple relationships and power dynamics in just a single, carefully conceived and designed, shot. Another example of articulating power dynamics through cinematography, as well as set design and staging, is this scene where Kane has to sell off assets in the wake of the Great Depression. Initially, Kane retreats to the background, where he is dwarfed by the large set, signifying his dwindling power. However, as it is revealed that he will still hold a large degree of influence, Kane returns to the foreground, showing that he maintains some authority in spite of his losses. Consider too the relationship between Kane and Leland. Early scenes show the two together in fairly tight profiles, more or less equal in scale, but after Kane's affair is revealed, and the two come into conflict, a wide shot emphasizes the growing distance between the two men. This culminates in the opera review, where Leland is first a tiny figure in the background, while Kane, in big close-up and in the foreground, turns his back on his friend. So important was the cinematography to Citizen Kane that Wells shares his title card with Toland. Years after the fact, Wells was quoted as saying, It's impossible to say how much I owe to Greg. He was superb. Citizen Kane was born from the collaboration between a plethora of artists and technicians, who each played a critical role in bringing the film we know to the screen. Wells himself is certainly worthy of acclaim and credit, as the accomplishment of Citizen Kane is still his, but it isn't just his. Studying the film's production history, from Wells' arrival in Hollywood, to the early scripting sessions with Mankiewicz, to the extensive meetings with Ferguson and Toland, reveals the extent to which other creative voices shaped Citizen Kane. Without such collaboration, Wells' first movie, and film history as a whole, would be dramatically different. <laughs>